This is Coding Math, Episode 41, Isometric 3D, Part 1. We did a short series on 3D a while back. I'm not sure how much more I really want to go on that series. I feel that what I presented is pretty useful for situations where you need some very simple 3D effects. But if you want to go much beyond that in HTML and JavaScript, you need to start looking at WebGL. I do hope to do some WebGL videos later at some point, but today we're going to go down a different path. I don't think I have to tell you what isometric 3D looks like. It's used in all kinds of games and has been for years. You'll sometimes hear isometric 3D described as 3D without perspective, but that's not entirely right. Perspective refers to any clues that indicate the distance of an object from the viewer relative to other objects. For example, there's aerial or atmospheric perspective, where distant objects are more hazy and closer ones are more clear. There are others I won't go into, but the one we're all familiar with is linear perspective. This is where objects appear to get smaller as they get further away, when parallel lines converge to vanishing points, etc. This is the type of perspective that isometric 3D lacks. Now generally, isometric games are rendered as tiles on a grid, like so. We have one ground axis going this way, and another going this way, and a vertical axis going this way. When you add in the vertical axis, you split the tiles into triangles. The reason it's called isometric is because when you look at the angles of those triangles, they're all 60 degrees. Isometric. Equal measurement. You can also look at the coordinate system axes themselves. Here we have 120 degrees between each axis. So, isometric. Now notice I didn't label any of these X, Y, or Z yet. We'll get to that. Now here's something you might not know. Not all isometric systems are really isometric. Rather than a nice clean 120 degrees, the angles used for these two angles are often 116.565 dot dot dot. And for this one, 126.869 dot dot dot. Because we now have two different measurements, this is actually diametric projection. Now why the heck would anyone use such crazy angles instead of 120 all the way around? Well, let's go back to looking at a tile. Here, this top angle is 126.869, as is the bottom one. The two angles on the sides wind up being 53.130. You'll find that those four add up to 360 degrees. Now let's think of the dimensions of this tile. A designer is probably going to make a bunch of tiles in Photoshop or something, and you'll need to tell them how wide and how tall to make them. For simplicity, let's say this is going to be 100 pixels wide. How tall should it be? Well, we can zoom in on this triangle here. This distance is half the tile, or 50. The angle is half of 53.130, or 26.565. Now, if you take the tangent of 26565, including all the decimal places, you get 0 0.5. That means that this distance is half of this, or 25. And that makes your whole tile 100 by 50. Your designer will be very happy. Let's look at what the dimensions would be for true isometric 3D. The tile angles would be 120 and 60, and we'd be finding the tangent of 30 which is 0 0.57735 dot dot dot. This makes your tiles 100 by 57.735 dot 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 pixels. Your designer just quit. This also affects how lines are drawn. Drawing a line at an angle of 26.565 degrees, every time you move horizontally two pixels, you move up one pixel vertically. Pretty clean. At 30 degrees, you move up one pixel every time you move horizontally 1.732 dot 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 pixels. So your lines wind up being more ragged. This may not matter as much now with fast, high quality anti aliasing, but in earlier days it made a big difference. Yeah, I'm probably making this more of a problem than it might actually be in real life, but you can't argue that a perfect 2 to 1 ratio is simple and elegant. And at the end of the day, most people call it isometric, even when it's diametric. In fact, I'll keep calling it isometric too. But now you know the dirty truth. Now before we get into coding, we need to discuss the axes again. We have two axes that run along the ground, and one that goes vertical. 
you will probably call these X, Y, and Z. Now, from what I've seen, there's no 100% consensus on which is which. Since movement on the ground is usually the primary interaction, the two ground axes are usually X and Y, with Z being the vertical axis, as it's less used in many cases. I'm going to make this the X axis and this the Y axis. Don't like that? Swap them around to whatever seems right to you. I won't be upset. You can even call them something totally different if that helps you be less confused. All the stuff we do will work the same way no matter what labels you apply to these things. Now the center will be 0, 0, and we're going to use individual tiles to count by, not pixels. So these tiles here will be 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, etc. And these will be 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, etc. And of course in here we'd have 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, etc. We won't be dealing with the vertical axis just yet. So let's get started coding. First of all, we want the origin to be in the horizontal center of the screen, near the top. So we'll translate to width divided by 2, 50. I'm also going to specify a tile size. I'll do this by making the variables tile width at 100 and tile height at 50. Now normally you'll be using pre-created bitmaps as tiles. But drawing tiles with code will help you understand where things are going and how they fit together. So let's make a draw tile function. This will get an X, a Y, and a color. To make things simple, we'll save the context, translate to XY, and restore the context before we leave. This translation isn't exactly right, but we'll fix that later. Then we'll begin a path and just draw some lines around the outside of the tile. First, we'll move to 0, 0. This will be the top center of the tile. Then we'll move to tile width divided by 2, tile height divided by 2. This is the right hand corner. Then 0, tile height, will be the center bottom. And minus tile width divided by 2, tile height divided by 2, will be the left corner. Finally, we can close the path, set the fill style, and fill the rectangle. Then we'll just call this function with position of 0, 0 and red. And yay, your first isometric tile. Let's draw another one, this time at 1, 0 with a color of green. Well, that almost entirely overlaps the first one. You might be able to see a one pixel wide strip of red there. That's because we translated to XY in terms of pixels, but X and Y are actually tile positions. So we need to turn those numbers into pixel positions. Tile 1, 0 should go down here. So its top should be here. That's a half a tile width over and a half a tile width down. Likewise, tile 2 should be over here, a full tile width over and a full height down. So as we move out on the x-axis, each screen x and screen y needs to move a half a width and a half a height. So here in the code, we need to multiply x by tile width divided by 2, and the y position by tile height divided by 2. But that also has an x component in it as well. y is 0 now, so this will do nothing. But x plus y times tile height divided by 2 will work. So I'll also draw another tile at 2, 0 with blue. Test that. And then it looks pretty good. Now what about what we changed the y axis? Let's make another tile as 0, 1, yellow, and 0, 2, purple. OK, those are a bit messed up. The screen y values are right, but they're all just hanging out in the center. It looks like as we increase the tile y, we need to decrease the screen x value by half a tile width. So that becomes x minus y times tile width divided by 2. Test that. Perfect. Now let's put it through its paces and make a whole grid. We'll do a double for loop, 0 through 10 for x and 0 through 10 for y. Inside that, we'll draw a tile at each of one of those x, y's. I'll call random color to get a, well, you know what it gets. And I'll paste that function here so that it actually works. Now let's look at what we've created. 
Ooh, psychedelic tile world. Now, in some isometric worlds, you don't simply have flat landscapes. Some tiles are on different levels than others. This can become confusing due to the lack of linear perspective. When a tile raises a full unit on the vertical z-axis, its screen position is the same as another tile 1x and 1y and 1z lower. This ambiguity has been exploited to wonderful results in the game Monument Valley. But let's go ahead and draw some blocks. I'll make a draw block function. This will take an x, y, and z property. It should also take three color values because we're going to be drawing three faces with different colors to give it some shading. But to keep things simple, I'm just going to hard code these in the function itself. If you build something like this out yourself, one option might be to supply a base color and programmatically darken or lighten that color to create the other two shades. I'll start out like we started out in Draw Tile, doing the Save, Transformation, and Restore. This gets us in position. Now I'm going to draw the top of the block. This is going to be largely the same as the tile drawing we just did, so I'll paste it in here. The difference is that all the screen Y coordinates are going to be offset by minus Z times tile height. In other words, we're taking that tile and lifting it up off the ground by minus Z, multiplied by tile height to give us screen coordinates. We'll also change the fill style to top. Now if we drew this as is, it would just be a confusing mess because there's no context as to where these blocks are. We need to draw the sides of these blocks. First the left side. This will start on the left corner of the top of the tile with the Z offset in place. Then we line to the bottom corner again with the Z offset. Then the bottom corner without the offset. This draws a line from the top face of the block back down to the ground. Then to the bottom left corner, no offset. Then we can close the path, set the fills dot to left, and fill it. The right side will be almost identical. We'll just swap the right corner in for the left corner by removing a couple of minus signs and change the fill style to right. Then I'll jump to the for loop and change draw tile to draw block. We'll need to provide a Z property. I'll create a random number from zero to four and floor it so it's a whole number. And bada bing bada boom, cube cities. Each time we refresh, a new configuration. Pretty neat. Now remember that I used math floor to make the Z value we passed in a whole number. There's no reason it has to be whole. Doing so makes nice cube-like blocks, but let's remove it and see what happens. Shazam! A whole different type of city. You don't have to just use random values either. In a future video, I'll show you how to design the tile layouts. But for now, you could even just use some math like I did here. The code for this one will be in the GitHub repo. Other than changing some sizes around, the only real difference here is that I calculated the Z value based on the XY values, basically getting the distance to the center of the grid and using that in a cosine wave. Old trick, but effective. Now you should have a pretty good feel about how tiles are placed. And it's time to look at a more real-world scenario where you're actually drawing tiles supplied by a graphic designer. I borrowed this tile set from a Deviant Art user who made them available for use. I'm not going to distribute the graphic with the code, but the link is there so you can get it yourself. As you can see, this image has multiple tiles, so we'll use it as a sprite sheet. The background is transparent, so that works well. Also notice that these are not simply flat tiles, but more like blocks themselves. However, since each block is the same height, we don't really have to worry about that. I measured the width and height of the top face of one single tile, and it turns out there are 60 pixels wide and 30 tall, 2 to 1 ratio. So they fit right into our budding isometric engine. Back in the code, I'll set the tile width and height to the size of the tiles we're using. Then we need to load this image in and delay any grid rendering until we know it's fully loaded. I'll create an image element and add an event listener to it. We'll listen for the load event, and in that we'll call a draw function. Then we'll set the source of the image element to the path to the image. The draw function simply wraps that double for loop that creates the grid. I'll comment out what's already in the loop, and instead call the draw image tile function. This will take the x and y, of course, as well as an index that indicates which tile to draw. 
I know that there are a total of 16 tiles, so I'll create a random integer from 0 to 15. Now onto the draw image tile function. Again, this will take an x, a y, and an index that points to which tile. We'll have to convert that index into a rectangle that encloses that specific tile in the source image, and then use draw image to draw that portion of the sprite sheet. For this version of draw image, we'll pass in the image we want to draw, then the rectangle we want to extract from that image, and then finally the rectangle on the canvas that we want to draw it into. Now the x position of the first rectangle will be the index times tile width. Easy enough. The y is 0 because we want to draw right from the top of the sprite sheet. Width is tile width. And height is the image height because again we want to draw the whole thing. We then need to specify a rectangle on the canvas to draw that into. Since we've translated to the xy, which is the top center of the tile, the x will actually be minus tile width divided by 2. y will be 0. And width and height will be the same as the first rectangle. And bam! We have a little isometric countryside, completely randomized. I'm going to go back in and change the initial translation to move it up a bit and change the loop limits to 25 to draw a larger grid. And boy howdy, we have a whole dang county. Now there's all kinds of things you can do with this. For example, I noticed that in the tile set graphic, the first four tiles are all water. So I could go in here to where we create the tiles translation. If index is less than four, we know we have a water tile. So I'll move it down five pixels. Otherwise, it's drawn as normal. And bang. Now the water is maybe a little bit more realistic, as if it's sitting just below the land. Anyway, that's the basics of how to set up an isometric system, draw your own tiles or blocks, or draw pre-rendered bitmap tiles. Not rocket science at all. And we'll be back with some more advanced techniques soon.